guys. So this is Dr. Ash coming in to you with a quick video on <clears throat> hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. And so this is kind of off by itself because it is such a serious um, kind of uh, complication, if you will. I was going to say side effect, but that's not really the right word. It's more of a complication of pregnancy. And so let's get into it. <clears throat> So there are a couple of different types of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. It used to be called um, uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension, uh, but it's kind of changed terminology here and there. But we have something called preeclampsia, which we're going to talk about. We have chronic or preexisting hypertension, which means I have come into the pregnancy already with an issue with hypertension. Uh, whether it be a chronic medical condition, um, whether it was just diagnosed or whatever the case may be. Uh, it could be before 20 weeks of gestation, but it, either way, it's chronic pre-existing hypertension or there's chronic hypertension, which again, we've come into it with the disease of hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, which means it's kind of elevated or escalated to the point of preeclampsia. And then we have what's called gestational hypertension, which again, used to be PIH or pregnancy-induced hypertension. So for gestational hypertension, that is technically a blood pressure that is high after 20 weeks. And usually the threshold is 140 over 80. So typically our gold standard is anything greater than 140 over 80 or 90. Uh, it can resolve after birth. However, the woman is at higher risk for um, gestational hypertension in subsequent pregnancy. So if this is the first pregnancy, then the second, third, fourth, et cetera, can also have hypertension, but also they are at risk for developing hypertension uh, later on in life. And so very similar to gestational diabetes, uh, once you get it in pregnancy, you are more likely to kind of develop this chronic condition as you get older. All right, let's talk about preeclampsia really fast. This is usually after 20 weeks because remember preeclampsia happens during pregnancy, but somewhere in the third trimester, occasionally it will happen before the 32 week mark. And that's just considered early onset preeclampsia. Nothing really to do there other than it just means the monitoring starts to happen a little bit sooner. Uh, preeclampsia can also happen in the postpartum period because remember there's still those hormones kind of adjusting. There's still some other things happening in the body as the woman goes back to the pre-pregnancy state. And so really that can happen uh, in postpartum as well. And then the probably most important part here is that it can lead to eclampsia. So preeclampsia can lead to eclampsia, which is essentially a seizure that occurs in response to the high blood pressure. So blood pressure is so high that it leads to seizure activity. And so <clears throat> a very common nursing diagnosis that goes along with preeclampsia is a risk for injury uh, because as you can imagine, if there's high blood pressure, it is a squeeze on the vessels, which means that the uh, baby is not getting the nutrients that it needs. And so there is potential harm there. Also, if there is a potential for seizures, when the mother is without oxygen, so will the baby. And so we ha often have to worry about uh, an injury to the fetus because of maternal hypoxia or, and or placental insufficiency, which is that squeeze on the uh, vessels. Another thing we need to mention here is HELP syndrome. And so HELP syndrome is really kind of a comorbidity or potential complication of going into uh, eclampsia or advancing from preeclampsia to eclampsia, we have something known as HELP syndrome. And HELP just simply stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet counts. So H hemolysis, EL elevated liver enzymes, and LP low platelet count. And the reason why HELP syndrome is so severe is because the red blood cells get destroyed, blood clotting is impaired. So hemolysis, that's where that comes from. Hemolysis is when um, the red blood cells begin to destroy. The low platelet count is going to impair blood clotting. And also having elevated liver enzymes is also going to put you at high risk for bleeding. So what can happen then is the liver begins to bleed internally, causes severe abdominal as well as chest pain. And unfortunately, if it's not recognized early enough, it can and will result in death. So this is an extreme situation in which it needs help. Okay. So that's the best way to remember help syndrome. Um, blood work is really the only way to determine whether or not this is going to be the case. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute.
but just recognizing that this is the foundation of HELP syndrome. So some key assessment findings for hypertension. So this is again, persistent hypertension. I don't mean like you just got off the airplane and you go to your prenatal visit, you got a little edema happening and uh, your blood pressure is up a little bit. This is no matter what we do, this blood pressure stays high. The other kind of key assessment that goes along with hypertension in pregnancy is swelling of the face or hands. So if you go back to the pregnancy module where we talked about swelling in the feet or edema in the feet, that is common. That is expected. That is one of those things. However, swelling of the face and hands is a big, big red flag. Headaches, of course, changes in vision, blurred vision, double vision, pain in the upper abdomen, like epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, a sudden weight gain. I don't mean like one pound. I'm talking like two or three pounds in just a couple of days. Difficulty breathing because again, they have a lot of pressure, they have a lot of fluid. So then we have breathing issues and then protein in the urine. And the reason why I have this start is because some of the more um, up-to-date research in regards to hypertension says that protein in the urine is not an indicator, not NOT, not an indicator. However, I do know that the nursing textbook still kind of refers to if the woman has three plus protein is something that we should follow up on because it's a high indicator of um, pregnancy induced hypertension or preeclampsia. However, just know that current research says that it is not an indica indication, but your nursing book probably still does. So if you're looking at a nursing test, you might wanna look for protein in the urine, but just understand that the real world is really not that case anymore. So some of the risk factors, these are things that put you at higher risk or put the woman at higher risk of having gestational hypertension. Of course, we've already said this, but previous gestational hypertension and subsequent pregnancies are gonna put them at risk. If this is the first baby, if there's a family history, women that are north of 40 years old, they're called geriatric mothers, which is a hard pill to swallow. Uh, African-American ethnicity, if you have uh, twins or triplets or quads, if you came into this pregnancy with previous medical conditions like hypertension, kidney disease, autoimmune disorders, diabetes mellitus, um, our fluffy women, so BMI greater than 26, and believe it or not, people who have undergone in vitro fertilization um, because the body really hadn't had time to adjust to the fertilization process, uh, we're starting a little late in the game. And so oftentimes uh, the response of the body is hypertension. So a couple of complications that I wanna talk about, and I think complications and interventions, and then we'll be all done. So um, placental abruption, remember that high blood pressure, that's putting pressure on the placenta. So it's a higher risk of separating too early. DIC, which is uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is, a really bad side effect. I mean, it's a really bad complication. So essentially what happens in the body is it's in a hyper clotting state. So it clots, clots, clots to the point where it depletes all of its clotting factor and then it begins to hemorrhage. So uh, the woman is at higher risk for going through uh, clotting and hemorrhaging all at the same time. Ugh, yikes. Fetal growth restriction. Of course, if there is a squeeze on the placenta, it's not getting enough supply. If it's not getting enough supply, then the fetus is not getting enough supply. Intracranial hemorrhage, uh, hepatic hematoma, again, that HELP syndrome, oligohydramnios, which is just a low amniotic fluid, placental insufficiency because of that squeeze, and then, of course, maternal and fetal death can happen, will happen if it goes untreated. So what are we going to do about it? This woman needs close, close, close monitoring. We have to monitor that blood pressure. They may even increase the amount of prenatal visits that have to happen. Of course, adequate fluid intake. We are nurses. We love to encourage fluid intake, at least three to four liters. Neurological status and deep tendon reflexes. So this tends to be our aha changes when we're worried about going into seizure-like activity. Deep tendon reflex be, reflexes become hyperreflexive neurological status worsens. We wanna assess the blood work again to make sure that we're not moving into DIC or moving into HELP syndrome. Uh, mag sulfate, so if the blood pressure gets bad enough, they will be hospitalized, the uh, mother will be hospitalized and placed on magnesium sulfate. And so the two big things that go with mag sulfate, 
One, assess for toxicity, which I'm going to go back to. And number two, calcium gluconate is your antidote. This is a question that loves to pop up, not only in nursing, but also the NCLEX. They love for you to know the antidote. So if there is a drug that has an obvious antidote, which means we talk about it, um, that is something to remember for your uh, licensing boards. But mag sulfate, remember magnesium is a smooth muscle relaxant. So if I'm getting too much magnesium, my toxicity, hypotension, depressed or absence, absent deep tendon reflexes, so hyporeflexia, decreased urine output, central nervous system depression, they feel warm, they might be sweaty. So in the order of interventions of things you should do, you're gonna stop this mag, you're gonna call the provider and you're gonna to prepare to administer calcium gluconate, uh, which is another kind of testing strategy I want you to keep in the back of your head. As nurses, we cannot administer a drug unless it's ordered. So you're gonna hear it one of two ways. You're either gonna hear prepare to administer or you're gonna hear it as uh, administer mag sulfate or calcium gluconate as ordered. Okay, so those are your two keys. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, please leave a comment, like, and or share all of the above. Make sure you subscribe for future videos and I'll see you in the next one.